Jumbo. Uh, good evening, everyone. I can't say just Flagstaff. Good evening, everyone, wherever you are, but you are still uh, a part of our lived Black experience community. We are celebrating this evening our final uh, night of our Kwanzaa community celebration. So this is the seventh night, which is the final night of Kwanzaa. And to, to this evening, we will be uh, celebrating faith. And so for those of you who maybe this is your very first time uh, joining our Kwanzaa celebration, welcome. Uh, but welcome to you all. Please know that you can go back and see those, um, our last six evenings um, on our Facebook page under the Lived Black Experience. Um, so Kwanzaa is a celebration of Black family, community. Uh, we, we acknowledge our place in the nation uh, we celebrate Black excellence and our achievements. And um, this is the 54th year uh, that Kwanzaa has been in existence. And uh, within the Kwanzaa celebration, uh, it's based upon seven principles that are called the Nguza Saba. And so since Saturday, uh, we have celebrated unity, we have celebrated self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, purpose. Last evening, we, we celebrated uh, creativity. And again, this evening, we're celebrating faith. And we've had a few um, community uh, members to come in from far and near uh, to lead the celebration. And uh, this evening, I'm very, very excited to welcome back uh, Sister Queen Sean Thomas. Uh, she was with us a few nights ago during our uh, celebration on Nia Purpose. And this evening, she is the celebration leader for Imani, which stands for faith. Welcome, Queen Sean, and happy Kwanzaa. Havaragani, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. So we're excited uh, that you're going to lead us uh, through a presentation, celebration uh, of Imani this evening. And so we're going to uh, get the presentation going and we'll see you on the other side. Thank you. So Imani means faith. It is Swahili for faith. It is the seventh of the Nguza Saba, the seven principles for blackness. And it is defined traditionally as to believe with all our hearts and our parents, our teachers, our leaders, our people, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. And as I was thinking about what to present and how to prepare for tonight, the word action just kept coming to mind. And really when we think about faith in this context, while indeed it is definitely a spiritual practice, in terms of Kwanzaa, the context is really faith in action. So a connected concept to this is that of Sankofa. So the Sankofa bird, which you see in front of you, is picking an egg from his back. So he's really oftentimes depicted as flying forward, but looking backwards. And the quotes here say that the Akan Ghana believe the past serves as a guide for planning the future. To the Akan, it is the wisdom and learning from the past which ensures a strong future and also that we must reach back to reclaim that which is lost in order to move forward. So there's a historical perspective 
And there is always going to be a spiritual perspective, especially when you are considering the whole of the Nguza Saba and faith as the final one. So faith in this context will tie the Nguza Saba together, meaning that you will have faith and you will have faith in action. And by practicing all of the Nguza Saba, you'll disrupt the mainstream narratives. And a familiar text that some of you might know is Romans 12, 2. And I just kind of worded it a little differently for our purposes here tonight. But really, we are called, all people are called to not be conformed to this world with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed by the renewing of our minds so that we can distinguish what God's path is for our lives, our homes, our communities, and our nation. And so that really is the essence of what Kwanzaa is about. Definitely the essence of the Nguza Saba and faith is the oil, if you will, that leads us forward and prompts us and inspires us every day to continue on. With faith, we have an individual and collective responsibility. I think that there's a lot in our current culture that talks about a cancel culture, all of the um, competitions that happen, um, on social media, on TV shows, there are so many different ways where we can get the message that we don't measure up between what's valued in our culture, between what's held up in terms of success, for beauty, even in terms of family organization and staff, jobs are meaningful. Excuse me, when actually we each have a gift and we each have a calling that we are to contribute as we talked about the other night for the betterment of our our families our nations our community and ourselves and really it's moving away from this idea of a great man's history to a people's history and this was actually a movement within the education field i'm going to say starting in the 90s really where people of color just started standing up and saying, you know what, what the textbooks are teaching, that's just not quite how it happened. And we tend to have um, a desire for idols and idols and idol worship, meaning that we want to point out a single person as having been that person who made a difference. And then the, le the rest of us can be left wondering, well, what is my value? What is my purpose? And, you know, what can I do? What is the value in my life? What is the meaning of my gift? And we're actually going to have a little quiz here in just a minute. So you see before you two pictures. I'm sure that you probably are well aware of the person on the right. Who is, can anyone say, can you jot it in the chat? Who is the person on the right? Rosa Parks. Who is the person on the left? I wish I had the Jeopardy music. The person on the left is Claudette Colvin and she was 15 years old and nine months prior to Rosa Parks being arrested for not giving up her seat on the bus. Claudette was arrested nine months prior, but she's not the one that we mostly know for a number of reasons. Um, it's also interesting to note that when Rosa Parks was arrested, that was not the first time that she had had an incident or run in either, but we know of that single incident. So in it really does all of us a disservice to believe that change happens in an instant when really it took the day-to-day -day efforts of both of these women and many others like them to change, um, to bring the Montgomery boycott, bus boycott into action. We have here two other women of notoriety that you may know. On the right, we have Dolores Huerta, who is well known for her organizing efforts with Sarah Chavez. And then on the left, we have 
uh, Maria Moreno, who was the first union representative of the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee. And let me tell you, this woman had many children and she would pack them all up, put them in the back of the truck of her of the pickup truck, she and her husband, Luis, and they would go farm to farm organizing the workers. And so she definitely is a companion to the work that uh, Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez was doing, but just lesser known. And she ended up becoming more of an independent organizer because of the dynamics within the party. And of course, everyone's current favorite, Kamala Harris. But who is this on the left? One of my personal favorites. Let's see, in 1972, I was seven years old, but I definitely recall the buzz in my home from my parents when Shirley Chisholm, who's pictured here, decided to run. So Shirley Chisholm in 1968 was the first black woman elected to Congress and she uh, represented New York. In 1972, she was the first black candidate to seek a presidential nomination from either from any major political party. And she was the first woman to seek the Democratic Party's presidential nomination. So as thrilled as we are with Ms. Harris, we must also give credence to the fact that Shirley Chisholm, um, you know, tread that path as well. And two more of my favorites. On the right, we have Frederick Douglass, as you know, I'm sure most of you know, abolitionist and well-known orator, author, and then the first uh, U.S. attorney, uh, federal marshal, I'm sorry, federal marshal, first black federal marshal. Pictured next to him is David Walker. Around the same time, in 1829, he wrote a series of pamphlets appealing to the colored citizens of the world. And his reason then was to organize and to build consciousness and really trying to get the um, colored people, so-called at that time, to organize and to do so at first not violently, but then as things became uh, more dire, he did have some by any means necessary kind of bent to what he was saying. But again, lesser known, but paved the way in a contemporary for the work that Frederick Douglass is known for. Two more of my favorites. We have Cornell West on the right with his hand raised, who is a professor, a political activist, an author. And he is known for when he draw, when he makes his political comparisons, they are often steeped in spiritual traditions. Um, and he carries this through in his work and in his life. So, for example, he is noted as saying that Obama, we wanted Obama to be Moses, but when he was elected, he had to act as Pharaoh. And then the other person pictured is uh, Bayard Rustin, who was just very active behind the scenes and a lot of the organizing that happened during the civil rights and then afterwards later on with gay rights. But very, um, he too was, he did activism, he published, he was a journalist, he did all of these things, choosing at first to be behind the scenes. He draw, drew, draw, drew also on a, a pacifist approach to um, his work and he was inspired by what he had read um, from A. Philip Randolph and in terms of how the Quakers approached to pacifism and then what he had read of socialism because he really did feel that it had to be all of us or none of us and to look out for one another. And I put the names here in case you want to go back and do some additional research on your own. So when we think about Imani and when we think about faith, we talked earlier this week about having a spiritual practice and the things that feed your soul so that we can be shored up and fed each and every day. And in the doing of that, 
you know, I just want to encourage us not to discount or dismiss the seemingly small things from the person that organizes to the person that addresses an envelope. Whatever it is that you do, it all matters. And to make sure that we're dipping back into the Nguza Saba throughout the year, that we must have an understanding of unity, that we must constantly be aware of the tapes that are playing in our heads and out there in the world at large so that we are practicing Kujichagalia and determining and defining ourselves. And definitely collective work and responsibility. It is going to take all of us across multiple communities in order to make a difference and to, you know, keep get this train on the right track. We've talked about cooperative economics, which is certainly a timely discussion to have now, especially as many businesses um, have had such grave difficulties coming out of the pandemic. And then the new businesses that have popped up because of the pandemic, all of all of those venues are value are valid and we um, should support in as far as it's possible, definitely black owned businesses and community businesses and then the mom and pops and doing what we can to practice cooperative economics. And then of course we have Nia to remember our purpose, creativity, and then finally faith. And using faith restoratively as grounding and inspiration that confirms the value and the validity of our individual and collective struggle in all of its forms. Because I think what the pandemic has shown us is that some people, for some people, this has been a season of blessing and a season of transition. For others, it's been a season of drought. And so we just need to be aware that each individual on this earth and on this planet is on is at a different place in their journey. But every form of struggle that results in the renewing and the transformation of the individual and then uh, accordingly the community and the collective, that is value. It can be difficult, of course, right? Because you can see that you can hear the comments, you can see the words, you can be on social media, the news, all of these uh, things that come at us that can cause us to doubt and to have disbelief. And just to remember that there is help, there is help in the spiritual realm and there is help in the natural realm. And as far as the spiritual realm is concerned, when there are times that we feel that our faith is wavering and we will, and we can just look up and say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief and to call to be strengthened and to call to have a person to come along that we can connect with that will help to carry our burden and to make that burden just that much lighter because we are working, because we are struggling individually and collectively. So in the end, we are to believe, receive, conceive, and transform. Now, this is one of mine and Reverend Lewis's favorite organizers, activists, Ella Baker. Ella Baker was inspired by her grandmother who would tell her stories of what it was like to endure and struggle and to still maintain her identity and to keep the snatches of her dignity that she could living under the system of slavery. And this inspired Ella Baker to become a student activist in college for policies that she felt were unfair. And then as you go on and read about her life and her commitment and her dedication, her faith in action, um, there is not, I mean, I think we'd be hard pressed to find the civil rights organization or movement that she did not touch. From NAACP to SCLC to SNCC to CORE, Freedom Riders, Freedom Summer, I mean, her legacy is just so rich. And it was all because she just felt that A, there was enough work to be done in terms of 
activism and civil rights that we should all be participating. And then B, that that participation should lead to equity in terms of employment and housing and just all across the board. So she's just a an unassuming kind of a heroine or shero, but one that really speaks to making a difference in all walks of life and all because she was inspired by the stories of humility and dignity of her grandmother. And with that, Reverend Lewis, I turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. That was really um, <clears throat> a very beautiful presentation, very inspiring. And um, I love it. Our viewers have been um, posting some, some wonderful comments and questions. Um, the, the most recent question um, I, I'd like to, to put up on the screen, Queen Sean. If you can take a look at it and maybe we could discuss this because this is um, often something that for our for our female viewers, this is something that we quite often deal with. Um, we are no matter what race or ethnicity, um, we are the mothers um, mm. of our culture of the we're the mothers and ants in the workplace, at home, uh, wherever we are, uh, in meetings, in our professional and our personal lives. Can, can you give us um, some wisdom on this question? So I, I would say that um, for me, it's in the honesty of it, right? So I remember, so we have two children, Maya is 19, Aoife will turn 17 tomorrow. And when Maya was born, I was midlife, right? And even though my mother-in-law and extended family were very supportive, my own mother had already passed. So it was a difficult time for me. And I, would, I was a member of a birth group. And I remember going to the birth group and I was trying to name how it was that I felt. And I remember telling the other mothers, I said, no, I think I have postpartum depression. Now they felt the same way, but they didn't want to call it that because they felt that there was some shame in naming what it is that they were feeling. And I would submit that there is power in naming how you are feeling. So that if you can put a name to the hurt or the depression or the fear or the depletion, name it and say that's what it is, A. B, remember that all of your relationships are subject to renegotiation. And so if you need additional assistance or if you need different assistance, then don't be afraid to say, hey, this is what I need from my partner, from my job, from my home, from my family you know, and so that you can have the appropriate kind of support at the right time. Because otherwise, as I can also testify, you will become angry and you will not be very useful. So first, if you can name what it is that you are feeling and then B, negotiate within your relationships and the various areas of your life that, you know, to talk about what it is for appropriate help then then those are the ways that you can continue to, we can continue to reach out and to make a difference regardless of our stage of life or what's going on in our emotional landscape. We have another question from Sister Gigi, who was our celebration leader on last evening for creativity. Is faith only related to religion, Queen Sean? I don't think so. And that's why I was thinking about tonight's um, reflection in terms of faith in action and choosing to use activists, the majority of whom, yes, definitely have a spiritual foundation. My personal belief is that you do need a spiritual practice to make it through life, especially as a woman of color. Um, but there is activism in the civic realm that is not related to spiritual 
tenants necessarily. However, faith in that case would mean hope or progress or future. Here's another question from one of our faithful viewers, my big sister in, um, well, she's my Geechee Gullah sister, but she's now residing in Georgia. Um, how was faith defined? So I'm going to uh, refer back to the first um, slide in the in the presentation tonight, which is the accepted definition that we use when we're talking about Imani, and that is to believe with all our hearts in our parents, our teachers, our leaders, our people, and the righteousness of victory of our struggle. Um, and also thinking about the time in which Kwanzaa was conceived and created, that makes sense because we were, it was a call for community unity and it was a call for community action. So because of that, you would then in restoring people to their, our people to their former greatness, you would ask that the belief be placed in the people in terms of saying, I trust you, I see you and I value you. Definitely. Earlier in your, your presentation um, and in the comments, um, our chiefess, Chiefess Deb talked about, or she made the comment about um, how if everyone uh, contributed to the community, then it would not be uh, maybe so much for just one or, or two. Uh, to do. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we can uh, begin and, and why we should begin to have these types, why it is important to have these types of gatherings before Kwanzaa um, in order to get to know um, our community better? Well, I think first of all, because even though we have more technology at our fingertips than in any other generation in history, in many ways, we're also more isolated. And I know for me, again, as a mother of teenagers, I worry about their ability to establish relationships human to human. So if for no other reason, we need to have these gatherings outside of these seven days so that we do not lose what it, the ability to connect and to hear one another. Because again, what my strength is, is going to be different from yours. And the problem that I may see may be different from how you see it. And then the way that we approach solving it will be different. But again, each of those ways is valid. My gift is valid. My, my way of solving it is valid as well. But we're just much stronger when we are connected together. Absolutely. Can, and, and so can you expound more on how um, we're, we're going to soon be joined by some other community members um, on the screen. And I think one of the most pressing questions I have had this week is um, how and, and why it is so important, um, how all of these seven principles, how they all build upon each other or stand on each other, but unity is definitely the foundation. Um, how do we do this in, in the midst of this pandemic? Well, that's where the technology can work for us. Um, that's where the online shopping can work for me, right? Because if I'm committed to Ujamaa and cooperative economics, all of a sudden now, I'm not bound just to my little town. I can go online and I can you know, look up Afrocentric prints for, for a closet hanging. I can look up products that are from black owned and operated supply companies. And I can practice Ujamaa, especially now when there's such a push 
for, you know, free shipping and delivery or whatever it is. So it can definitely work for me. And then I would also say the, the converse is true during this time of slowdown, which again, admittedly, for some people, it is tranquility. For other people, it is stressful. But we can carve out in this time of slow and silence, time to reflect upon Kujichagalia and think about who am I? What changes do I need to make? What do I need to keep? Yeah. You know, and so just to kind of um, make the times work for us. Exactly. I'm going to begin to welcome into the studio some of our other uh, community members, and I'm uh, pleased to bring in this familiar face. I call her my baby queen, but this is Sister Kara, and she does a stupendous job um, bi-weekly uh, moderating our uh, discussions on um, some very hard topics um, as we seek to, to inform, educate, um, and enlighten um, our, our viewers. Um, happy Kwanzaa. Happy Kwanzaa. I want to start out by asking you, um, is the, I mean, how many, how have you, how many times or how many years have you been um, celebrating Kwanzaa or was this the first year and, but what's your, your experience with, with this important holiday to we as a people? Yeah, for me, this was actually my first year really engaging with it. And I think this was the year that I needed it um, probably more than ever before. I think um, in the past, there's been just so much else going on and uh, a lack of focus when it comes to this time of year on, you know, these principles and, and this idea of, of um, particularly Black community unity. Mm -hmm. um, and this year, I think with all that we've done throughout this year and with all that's been happening throughout the year, and I think heightened by the isolation of quarantining and, and isolating and all of that because of COVID, it became so much more clear how important this is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you have um, a favorite principle um now that that you've gone through this uh these seven days my favorites are always creativity and faith because those are i think the two that um resonate not necessarily the most with me but that have definitely been the strongest in uh, in my life as a writer and poet and an artist and all of that. So the creativity is always very strong, but also as, uh, as a person of faith. And I think um, I love that, that we went into that question of, is there a difference between religion and faith? Because personally, I'm not a religious person, but I am a person of faith. Um, and I think that's such a strong distinction. And I think the, the power of faith being that, action that um, Sister Sean talked about is is so important and again even more so this year. Absolutely. Thank you for for sharing that uh, with us. I have another guest um, who has been a part of the lived black experience that I'd like to bring into the studio and I'm excited to to welcome Brother Lumpkin. Um, because I'm going to ask him to uh, be a stand-in for, for all of the brothers who have been a part of um, our Lived Black Experience project. I, I, Any time that I can uh, honor um, our kings, I'm, I'm always 
delighted to do so. So I'm very, I'm very honored. I'm very happy and humbled, Brother Lumpkin, to, to welcome you to the broadcast. And I thank you because you've, you've been a part of this celebration a few nights during this week. And so can we get your thoughts on, on what Kwanzaa means to you, particularly as a black male in America at this particular time? You know, first and foremost, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, be part of the, uh, the experience and it truly is the live black experience. So thank you very much for having me and uh, the brothers here in uh, Phoenix and uh, Phi Beta Sigma, our chapter, want to extend a, a hello and a happy new year to all each and every one of you. So thank you. Um, and as far as to answer your question, what Kwanzaa means to me, you know, it's, 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 it's very interesting. I think now we're, we're going through, especially with, with these times, like a metamorphosis in terms of, um, you know, just, uh, I think the world, uh, our nation acknowledging that, you know, there is culture, you know, we're, we're going to actually walk the walk the talk, you know, like, hey, we're not just going to talk about culture, we're actually going to, you know, you see companies, um, you know, now having having more uh, um, diversity hires, you know, adding adding diversity to their staff. And so it's the culture around it. So for me, I'm very proud to be part of uh, part of being the, the you know African Americans in terms of being able to now feel comfortable to embrace you know my my ancestry and Kwanzaa is certainly a part of our our ancestry so you know what it means to me it just it makes me feel proud because I think our traditions and you know the diversity that that we have is is now being not just acknowledged but you know even more so appreciated so that's that's what it, to me that's what it what it means to me beautiful beautiful um how long have have you been celebrating kwanzaa or you know, is it a tradition in your family in your household you know i i grew up um so my grandfather was a a, a christian minister and you know he he was he was old school and and so that's you know kind of how my uh, my mom was was brought up, and so Kwanzaa wasn't really huge uh, in their household. So growing up, that wasn't necessarily something that that we really uh, took part of. It was only in in recent recent years that you know, especially with with social media and especially with um, you know just the, the 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 different mindset as far as like being becoming older and appreciating some things as far as my my culture. That's when I started really to, to kind of look look into um, Kwanzaa and understanding the values and the traditions and things of that nature with regards to, to Kwanzaa. So for me, you know, I'm learning just like, you know, a, 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 a third, fourth grader would learn how to write cursive, which I think that's a dying art, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> but again, you know, it's something that, you know, I'm, I'm also learning the traditions and and things that you know we hold near, near and dear to our our culture and our heritage. Well, I have to share with you as as you're speaking. Um, our chiefess um, made a comment. It's so great to see Phi Beta Sigma being represented uh, this evening. Um, we really, and I'm, I'm going to ask you in just a moment to share. Um, something uh, with us, but we're very happy that you have joined us um, this evening. Someone else who's been a familiar face this week, um, before I ask you another question, Brother Lumpkin, I want to bring in this lady, and there she is. And um, so- Love the hat. <laughs> <laughs> it is fab, it is fab. It is. <laughs> so, Brother Lumpkin, because um, uh, Sister Kara knows, and, and definitely Honorable Sister Coral knows, um, can you share with, with our viewers um, how Phi Beta Sigma uh, has been engaging with our Black community here in Flagstaff? 
Well, first and foremost, we 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 find it an honor to to serve the uh, the community, uh, not just um, in the Phoenix area, but um, statewide. You know, because you know we all are, are part of you know the the fabric of, of Arizona. We all make up the foundations that um, you know that we that we herald. And uh, you know, I'm very uh, honored to have uh, served the the needs of the uh, Flagstaff residents in terms of. What we've done, Phi Beta Sigma is not just an organization designed strictly for our um, uh, the, our African American um, culture, but it's also we we want to serve the needs of the community in general. So whether that's uh, uh, Hispanic, Native American, white, you know, those that really that really need our need our help. And just to give you an example of that, uh, we recently had a um, an event where we supported the Sojourner Center, which is uh, one of the largest uh, women's domestic violence shelters in the nation here in, in the Phoenix area. And, uh, you know, we didn't discriminate who was who was coming to the table to eat because we actually um, basically bought their their entire dinner, um, their Thanksgiving dinner. And that was something that, you know, the, the area that the uh, the organization was very uh, um, appreciative of because they can use that money for, for other things, clothing and and, uh, and and other and other items, but in terms of the Flagstaff area in general, uh, we worked closely with the Murdoch Center this this past year. Um, you know, I, I know our state director, um, Brother Warren Brown, who by the way is is actually transitioning to uh, Dubai as we as we speak. Um, he was very instrumental in uh, helping with uh, you know the facilities there. I know he did some work there where he actually upgraded the uh, the bathrooms. I'm sure uh, um, Sister Evans really appreciated that from 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 what I was what I was told, but you know just in general, um, you know, and also the brothers went up there to help clean up the area. Uh, I believe we added a Wi-Fi hotspot there, um, and also you know we we were just there just to to lend a hand whenever whenever we were called. So as far as we're concerned, you know, Flagstaff is is a city that we're going to adopt, and so you would definitely see us see us there. Probably in the spring <laughs> when, okay. it, when it warms up, but yeah. uh, but but outside of that, uh, like I said, there's just one of the few things that that come to mind. But you know, like I said, it was it was a, a joy and a treat for us. And uh, like I said, that's something that we won't stop, especially since we have a uh, an undergrad uh, chapter up there. So I'm mm -hmm. part of the graduate chapter in, in Phoenix and. Uh, our Flagstaff undergrad chapter at NAU is actually one of our chapters that we that we over, oversee. So we will definitely be up there um, often. And uh, again, we certainly look forward to dropping by to see what we can do to, to help. So when we're in the neighborhood, especially. We like hearing that and thank you. And so with that being said, Honorable Coral, um, you know, you're just, you're just like, I think two steps out from your 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 service to to Flagstaff as as our mayor, um, you know when 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 the fraternity came up here and and did those several gestures, um, you know what can you speak to what that means uh, to a mayor of a city um, and and tie it in with with the principle of of collective work and responsibility. Does it tie in with that? How does it tie in, um, you know, with with unity within the community? Your mic. <laughs> There we go. It's awesome to see everyone here tonight and um, to be here as part of this community celebration and to see the different comments and thoughts that are being um, posted and um, talked about, right? I appreciate this question because I think it ties into really what Kwanzaa is all about. Um, a lot of times people think government can fix everything. They think that government is the solution they think that it is the role or the responsibility for whoever is in what, whatever position to do it all. And government, quite frankly, can't do it all. And nor should government, I think, um, there's some things government shouldn't do. There are some things government should do, but I don't think that government can do everything. 
And so I think when you talk about collective responsibility, that is all of us working together. That's about community and action. Um, and so when you look at what the fraternity did, um, we actually um, reached out because one of um, one of the fraternity members um, was saying something that uh, we thought should not be said. And there was a community meeting called. And when I walked into the meeting, the entire senior leadership of the fraternity was there from Phoenix. as um, And we were having a conversation about what was said, what needed to be done. Um, that ended up with a community uh, conversation and actually a workshop and a class about how do you interact with community and how are, how are you a part of community and how do you do community development and activism in a way that incorporates everybody. But, you know, the next thing we know, um, that grew into, by the way, we noticed that the restrooms, and that might be a small thing, right? But this is a community center um, that we love and that we cherish. Hey, there's people coming into this community center for these types of activities. And we noticed that the restrooms need to be upgraded. Next thing you know, the restrooms are being upgraded. Then by the way, we noticed your phone system and your internet system is antiquated. And in the middle of a pandemic, when kids need to be able to go to school and um, access to hotspots and to broadband is a problem, we would like to go ahead and donate the equipment and set it up so that whoever is around this building, um, even if they're in the parking lot, they have access to free um, internet and free um, and free uh, uh, Wi-Fi so they can do their homework, so they can do their banking, so they can look for a job, so they can be part of the community that is now largely online. Also, by the way, we noticed that the grounds of the Murdoch Center need to be upkept. We know that there's some pain that needs to be done. And so um, it's being part of the community and being active in it. And everybody can do that. So when you look at the different principles that we've talked about, you know, we've talked about, uh, Cooperative economics. We've talked about um, we've talked about our collective responsibility. We've talked about faith. We've talked about what does it mean to be community. What does it mean to be community? Um, we've talked about how to be create, creative. You know, Miss Gwendolyn last night talked about um, community, but asset based community development, and the fact that everybody can do something. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a gift of the head, a gift of the heart gift of the mind. Everyone has at least one of those gifts. And if you share your gift with the community, it makes the load lighter for everyone else. And so as, as a mayor, as a previous mayor, previous council member, when I see things like this, I think to myself, this is truly community in action. Mm -hmm. community doing for itself and not waiting for someone else to come along and do it. Absolutely. Um, Sister Sean, I, you know, we've we've been here a few years here in Flagstaff, and um, but you know the the Murdoch Community Center has been so many different things to us um, during your time here, and as someone who was here raising two young girls. Um, can you share with 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 the community um, what the Murdoch Center has meant to you and your family, and particularly as a mom, um, you know, raising two young two young girls here in Flagstaff? So I, the word that comes to mind is hub. It was for me the hub of not just the community but the black community. And I, because I want to qualify it by saying, yes, definitely raising two young girls, but raising two young black women in a predominantly white community that had its fair share of challenges, fair share of blessings, but there are also some challenging times. And so for us, when we think of the Murdoch, we think of Ju Juneteenth, we think of the Kwanzaa celebrations that we had in person, we think of the dance parties, we think of the ethnic studies lecture series, we think of the annual tea, we think of the things that happen that are important and germane to the black community happen at the Murdoch. And so it really is the community center that kept community going for us. And it was, and the girls would say the same thing, that those are their memories of it. Absolutely. Sister, Sister Kara, do you, do you have any special memories uh, of the Murdoch Center when we were 
and I mean, I, you know, we still have found a way to to come together for important meetings and, and social distance. We want to put that out there. Um, but prior to this pandemic, uh, do you have any special memories of, of the Murdoch Community Center? Yeah, I have two, actually. Um, the first being one of the first uh, Miss Cleo's tea parties that I went to and just seeing how many people came out, uh, how many of the women were wearing their Sunday hats and and <laughs> just that experience of having that uh, community tea and uh, and just sitting at a table. Um, the year that I'm remembering is, is actually a year that I um, intentionally sat at a table of, of elders and um, and some of the um, female community gatekeepers in Flagstaff and just listened to them. And at, at one point, one of them said, um, you're not saying very much. And we're like, we were having conversation at the table. And my thing was just, I just want to listen. <laughs> I just want to hear the stories that you all are sharing and and hear your experiences and, and just kind of it's just always that vision of you know sitting at the feet of of those and and learning from them and the other was uh, an event that was held where they actually had um, I think it was called seeds of wisdom or, or something like that where it was five or six um, community leaders who just shared their stories of growing up uh, within the black community of Flagstaff um, and again, it was just the experience of, of sitting and listening to their stories and hearing um, the things that they shared about what their experiences were like, um, sharing the story of what Flagstaff was and what it's becoming and what it, it how it's changed over their time. Um, and just giving that, that wisdom to um, other generations. I think what, what stood out to me there was just how quiet the room was in listening to them and looking around and seeing particularly some of the younger children who were there, who were also just enraptured paying attention to um, what these community elders and community leaders were sharing with us. So that is always my vision of, of the Murdoch uh, center. I think it's, um, I love that quote that's up on the screen about it being a well for the community and the idea of it as a hub. For me, it's really been a home and that sense of, of family that, you know, I don't have family or I didn't have family here in Flagstaff. And now very much I feel like I do. Um, I didn't have a sense of home in Flagstaff. And now very much I do because of the Murdoch Center. Absolutely. I, uh, uh, this post from our chiefess um, about the Murdoch Center being a sacred space, and and it really um, is a sacred space. Um, you know, I, when I think back, the, the Murdoch Center has just been, and it's it's what we as black people are are able to to create whatever it is whatever need we have, um, regardless of how difficult it may be, we somehow just have that ability to create out of our sheer need something, whatever it is that we need. And so, you know, when I think about the, about the Murdoch, it's been a church, it's been a school, you know, it is our sacred space. Um, you know, we we recognize mostly every time that we're there, we recognize our ancestors and do our uh, our ritual of 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 pouring water out uh, to to the ancestors. So that is really what has made it a sacred space that we have welcomed um, the memory. And, and the spirit of our ancestors there. It's the meeting place, it's the classroom, as Sister Sean said, and, and Brother Lumpkin, I'm going to ask you to give your testimony of what 
you know or what you had the opportunity to experience the Murdoch as you and 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 the brothers of the fraternity. Um, I forget how how when was it was it over the summer or late spring um, when we did our socially distanced. Um, activity and I'll let you share what that activity was to welcome the brothers and to thank the brothers for what they had done for us here at the Murdoch. You know, I believe that was um, the summer. And I, the reason why I'd say that it was because I, I remember it was in the seventies and, and maybe it was, you know what, maybe it was probably more like um, August right around that time yeah. and uh you know driving from phoenix and it's a hundred and hundred and a lot <laughs> and you know it, it was 75 and i'm like this is perfect <laughs> this is great so that's one one memory that that i take um but the other one really was we had had gone up there to um uh, do some do some painting uh in the, in the murdoch center there's a wall that uh, we are we have uh adopted um, so we will definitely uh, be there to uh, finish that up. But I remember just sitting and it was it was like I was in a room of folks that I've known for years. And even though I had met um, um, everyone, you know, several months earlier, it just felt like I was at home. And, you know, as far as for me, it just it was and, and I could speak you know, for the other brothers as well, because I think we all had very similar experience. It just, it just felt like we, we belong there, even though that wasn't our city, even though that wasn't a place that, you know, we had, had gone through, going to, you know, often, you know, that was, it just, it felt as though we, we belong. And, you know, Ms. Deb and um, yourself and uh, Sister Evans made us feel warm and made us feel welcomed made us feel appreciated and you know it, it was it was it was a good experience and matter of fact there was not a brother that when we're driving down the hill that didn't say something positive about what had transpired and we really um like i said look forward to uh you know working on other projects in the in the future and i know that you know one of the projects that we had talked about was uh remodeling the kitchen that was one thing, um, and so you know we'll we'll take the, take a look to see what we what we do as far as uh, to um, do something this year. So we're going to try to like do major projects as as often as, as we can, but just to kind of just to go back to what uh, what you had uh, had asked. It just like I said, it just felt like you know this some place I needed to be. And and isn't that truly what what community is all about? Um, you know, to to feel embraced, to feel welcomed, to feel safe, um, even if you're not in a familiar city or or uh, in a familiar space. Um, that is what true community is all about. Um, I'm I'm asking everyone to post what this celebration has meant for them, and I think we kind of uh, touched on that. Uh, Sister Kara kind of answered that, but if you want to come back in, and and Sister Sean, but I'm going to start with uh, Sister Coral. Will you share what this uh, seven day celebration has meant? Um, for you, because certainly, I mean, this is, I can't even remember, sis, how many, how many Kwanzaa celebrations have we done in the Murdoch over the past several years? But um, I don't know, it seems like this one may be, because it was different, we weren't able to be together. Um, would you share what this, these past seven days have meant to you? So I believe that this is the 10th annual community celebration of Kwanzaa. And uh, it was started with the Murdoch Community Center. Um, Miss Deb, uh, who is listening, um, was the, I guess, the push behind um, us starting. I think it's different this year because we normally just do one day of Kwanzaa. We do all 
um, seven days in one day um, because we don't take it the full seven days, right? I think it's different because we've had the opportunity to really sit back and reflect on the meaning behind each day and each principle. You know, for me, um, I've only been celebrating Kwanzaa since we started celebrating Kwanzaa here. And I'm very appreciative of the fact that I have had the opportunity to sit back and to listen and to learn and to better understand what Kwanzaa is, right? It's not an additional seven days of Christmas. It's not a religious holiday. Um, it's not all of these things, right? Um, and so for me this year, Kwanzaa allowed me to, I wouldn't say reset. I'm not sure that that's the appropriate term, but it has allowed me to sit back and fully understand and appreciate and think on the different principles and reflect on how I can move all seven principles um, forward into this new year. Usually when we do one day celebration, we pick one principle, we wanna carry that for the rest of the year. I actually wanna carry all seven and, and see how I can incorporate all seven. And what, what would that year look like if we were able to hold on to that? I like that. Uh, would anyone else care to share what um, or elaborate more on on what what this these past seven days have meant because it truly was very special to 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 really do it in seven days in which it, it is traditionally done. Um, so this has been very special, and um, we're already thinking about the next Kwanzaa celebration. I here's something that I'd I'd like to um put out to to all of you and and please the viewers add um to the comments um sister Gigi mentioned that um what was it meeting and and sister coral helped me with this about how to incorporate this into the community um uh, and and I think you came up, there's my niece. I think you came up with some ideas of, of how we can, can keep the spirit of Kwanzaa going for the entire 365 days. Would, would any of you care to, to contribute to that thought? Why not? What, um, I would think- Can I talk up? Oh, I would think maybe you wanting to actually listen. Like if you're from a different culture and you're confused on something, don't blurt it out. Don't be like, oh, this misconception, I'm just gonna blurt it out to you. Be like, hey, where did this misconception come from? Or, hey, I have a question. I don't mean to be rude. Don't randomly come up to a stranger and ask them something, but uh, try and, find a, a conscious grounding and then go forth with that. Try to learn who your neighbor is. And that could go for us trying to learn, because I know um, different generations, we have that struggle of trying to communicate and find those common grounds. So I feel like maybe being like, what, like, what type of music do you like? Oh, you like that. And then find that common ground and then slowly try and see that person in depth. I like that. And I think you can add that into the community. Be like, oh, you know how to fix that? Cool, we can make a workshop where we could learn how to do um, like painting or sewing. I like that. Sister Sean, what principle does that fit under? Here's our Kwanzaa test. <laughs> <laughs> I, that fits under D, all of the um, um but definitely unity, right? And collect and Ujima collective work and responsibility. Um, and we really have to get to the point to where we are able, as Destiny is saying, to commit to compassion and communication and community building. That Absolutely. that's just the way it, it it has to be, where we have to have this sort of commitment that says I'm going to put aside any any fears that I have or any discomfort again especially for 
generations younger than us to where now everything is a text, a tweet, a post, right? Yeah. And to make the commitment to have the compassion to communicate with the intention of building community. And I think that the Nguza Saba really is encapsulated in something as simple as that, as Destiny said so well, getting to know your neighbor. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Sister Kara, where are you with this uh, warning? Uh, how do you think this monthly Kwanzaa check-in would would work? Would it, what do you think would be the positives for, for our community and, and especially the lived black experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the idea of that because I think it helps us to, to keep carrying on. Um, you know, there's, there's the, sa the saying that says, keep on keeping on. And I think um, so often what I think particularly the black community comes up against and, and experiences is that, you know, we have a moment and then the moment is gone and we have momentum and then the momentum dies. Um, I think to the live black experience, um, uh, the black community strategic plan that we uh, developed and, and was adopted and um, the momentum that, that led up to that and now the question being, okay, so what comes next? And I think continuing this conversation helps us to keep it going and to keep things advancing. Um, I was reading in the comments, somebody saying that they, um, they're not black, but, the, but that they began watching in order to support um, actually you, Miss Bernadine, and saying that the blessings that came from listening and learning have simply blown me away. I have learned many things about myself and many things that I can incorporate into my classroom of college students to make my instruction more inclusive. This has just been such a bunch of blessings for me. Thank you just doesn't seem to be enough. And I think that just captures the importance of these sorts of community conversations and dialogues is that the conversation doesn't end. It just keeps going. And and um, it's not one opportunity to learn. It's endless opportunities to learn and engage with each other and, and see where this community is going um, and to see where the story of, of Black community is going. Um, I think one of the things that we've emphasized throughout all of what we've done done with this program has been um, that it's not just, although we are focusing on the live black experience, we're telling the story of the experience of, of Flagstaff and the story of Flagstaff. Um, and so as we continue to engage in this, we're engaging the entire community and helping the entire community learn and grow and and develop in ways that are so important for this community to thrive. So I see it as really important work. Absolutely. Um, Brother Lumpkin, how you being in Phoenix, you know, but how important do you think it is to find community outside of, because this is like now you, you and the brothers have embraced Flagstaff um, as a part of your community. So sort of the, not the traditional community. I, so how do you see that reaching out beyond um, the Phoenix area? How important is that? Uh, to the overall community, especially the black community? Well, I think we're, we're all, first of all, first and foremost, we're all neighbors. So whether they live right next door or whether they live down the street or where they live, you know, several miles away, you know, it's, it's a community. I mean, if you can get in your car and you can get there within a certain a short period of time, I mean, they're your neighbor, you know, so in, you know, we, we, we have universities that connect, the three major cities in Arizona. You know, I have a daughter who, uh, you know, is going to be college age at the end of this, um, end of this upcoming term. I might send up the Flagstaff. You know, so I mean, it, it's you know, just you can't just live in uh, live in your own own backyard and think that there's nobody out outside the gate. And you know, it's it's important that we 
work together and you know because uh, you know we want all of our communities to thrive not just in phoenix but in in flagstaff and tucson and and, and whatever the surrounding cities we're all neighbors and mm -hmm. so it's, it's important for us to uh help each other and uh work together because you know i collectively we'll we'll we we will do great things you know absolutely. versus being an individual absolutely absolutely um, Sister Coral, do you have our screen, our special ask screen um, ready to share as we come to the end of this has been seven incredible evenings. Um, and it's a wonderful way to begin um, our, our the new year. And I'm saying our because I'm thinking community. So our new year and, and how we are going to um, work, continue to work together, um, continue to become closer, uh, continue to to weave these, uh, the Nguza Saba into our lived black experience project. And so viewers, we, we are very happy. Um, it, it, it has been a wonderful um, past couple of months since June of 2020. Uh, up until now, we've been able to uh, create these uh, dialogues, these conversations and, and most of them have been difficult conversations and that's what we wanted to do with this project. We wanted to uh, to enlighten and, and educate and inform um, our, our other brothers and sisters um, about what it is to be in the skin that we're in, uh, where it is that we have come from, and where it is that we definitely are, are directing ourselves uh, to, to go. And um, so it takes time. We come together for programming, to discuss programming ideas. It's like we have our own little LBE television station network here. And, uh, you know, discussing what are, what are the... Uh, topics that we need to present. And, and um, you know, we have our in-house, our resident facilitator, and um, just a, a, a lot of energy and love goes into this project. And so we're at the point where we want to um, do more and we want to have more special guests and we want to be able to, to give them uh, honorariums for, for, for making the time to come and, and to, to speak with us. And so we're asking, we're not asking, um, and we, I won't start at $100 and then $50 and then $25. We're asking you um, whatever uh, spirit lays upon your heart. And if you feel so led, and if you find that this project is being helpful uh, to you and others in some sort of way, we're asking that in the spirit of giving, for it is better to give than it is to receive. Um, we're asking that you will consider giving us a small gift, maybe a few dollars every month, every couple of weeks would be very appreciated. So on the screen, you see our uh, PayPal um, link and also our uh, QR code um, that you can scan, pay, and go. Um, and I see a comment saying that this is LBE TV. I like that. And, and it, this experience is very much like a television network. Um, we, we don't just grab ideas out of the sky. We, we talk about ideas. We talk about what's relative to the times. And, um, and then we go out and search for those uh, people, those individuals who can come and give you uh, real facts, not 
something made up, not here's what I think you should know. Uh, the LB project is bringing you what it really is and what our experience has been and continues to be. So we thank you for you joining us. Um, we thank you for this um, opportunity to, to, to share with you uh, Kwanzaa, uh, how we view our families, our community, uh, our nation, and, and what we are determined uh, to be the message of we as Black people and that is we've come from greatness. We've always been great. Uh, the attempt was made to strip, strip us of it, but uh, still we rise is one of the themes that, that we've uh, has been a reoccurring theme this week. We rise, uh, we're here to stay. Um, we are, if you're not, or if anyone is not going to give us a place at the table, we're creating our own table and we are inviting everyone to be a part of it. And so with that being said, we light the final candle for this Kwanzaa community celebration. We light the candle of Imani faith, for it is faith that has carried us and has gotten us this far. And so when we think about how we got to where we are, uh, when we think about those who fought for us in order that we may be here right where we are this evening, we know that it is nothing but faith that has carried us through the struggle. And so earlier, Queen Sean shared um, Miss Ella Baker, um, who was a phenomenal woman, a civil rights uh, and human rights activist, and a few years ago, I can't remember how long ago, if you're familiar with the group Sweet Honey and the Rock, uh, they wrote a song and it's simply called Ella's Song. And the song recaps uh, the work or some of many of the sayings uh, that she's been remembered for. And so, in memory of Ella and all of those great people, men and women who have come before us, who made it possible that we should have a space to be here this evening. This is Ella's song. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Boom, 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 boom. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes, until the killing of black men, black mothers, sons, is as important as the killing of white men, white men, mothers, sons. We say we who believe in freedom can Boom, 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 boom. We who believe in freedom not needing to clutch for power, not needing the light just to shine on me. 
I need to be just one in the number as we stand against tyranny. We who believe in freedom can rest. Bum, 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 bum. We who believe in freedom struggling myself don't mean a whole lot i've come to realize that teaching others to stand up and fight is the only way I'm going to survive. That's why I sing. We who believe in freedom again. Boom, 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 boom. We who believe in freedom again. Thank you. Go in grace.